Friends, my topic today, I guess in the series of ideas uh, for life, is I call it three Jewish reactions to the Shoah, to the Holocaust. Because the Holocaust was not just an event that happened. It was a traumatic event for the Jewish people. And just like when a person goes through a trauma, it will affect them um, in a very specific way. And different people will be affected from the same trauma in different ways. So the Jewish people, because we are various communities and different people, so the trauma of the Holocaust of the Shoah affected us in different ways in different communities. And even if so, there's a grain of truth to each one, but uh, they have to be understood. And sometimes when it's misunderstood, it creates um, division within Jewish identity and Jewish communities because of this lack of understanding. And the three communities I want to mention is Israel, uh, the United States, and this next one is not geographical, but uh, religious denomination, what we should call ultra-Orthodox or Haredi. Let's start with Israel. <clears throat> Remember, the Yishuv in Israel, in a sense, was a new phenomenon. It was the activist Jew, the one who was going to create a new life for the Jewish people, people mostly from Eastern Europe, Russian Eastern Europe, who thought that the talk of the Chibat Zion movement was unnecessary. And uh, with the winds of change that were happening in Europe, uh, communism, socialism, and other nationalistic winds. They wanted to see something happening for the Jewish people, mostly young people. And um, they saw the idea of Zionism as a rejuvenation of Judaism, of something which was going to give a new Jewish identity, throw out the Galut Jew, and create something new instead. Now, this movement, of course, they obviously knew was different. Not only did it um, um, adopt the idea of agriculture and working the land, something which Jews for centuries couldn't do because they were not land owners, uh, even if they had no problem with it. But um, it was also the idea of nationalism, a state, uh, developing an army, uh, buying weapons. This was something which was foreign to Jewish thinking not because we were necessarily pacifists, but because this is the role that history gave us when you don't have a land. That's what normally happens. There's um, a book by, written by a Professor Robert Rockaway of Tel Aviv University. And the book was about Bugsy Siegel of the Chicago, the, one of the Jews from the Chicago um, Mafia. The name of the book was, But He Loved His Mother. <laughs> and uh, tells the story in the 1930s, uh, maybe the late 30s, maybe even beginning of the war. I'm not sure exactly when it was. Bugsy Siegel gets a, me is a meeting with a representative from the Yishuv in Israel. They want to buy weapons. <laughs> they want to buy guns. And he was both shocked and excited that there were Jews who were interested in buying guns. He'd never met Jews like that before. But this, um, the people in the Yishuv knew that they were doing something very different. They had grown up within the normative Jewish societies of the shtetl. They knew all about the way traditional Jews think. So they knew they were being uh, revolutionary and new, and that's what they liked. <laughs> it was, uh, they felt that they were creating a new future, a promising future for the Jew who fights against the circumstances. Now, the Shoah was a trauma. And I'm not even talking about the little things like how it affected the immigration to Israel, etc. But it was, and how all the, uh, of course, um, infrastructure uh, of the Jewish people fell apart. But I'm talking about the very fact that Jews were decimated. And it basically was, you might say, the antithesis or what the Yishuv warned against. That if Jews don't stand up for their own rights, this is what could happen. 
And this is exactly what happened. It's not for nothing that Jews in, in Palestine wanted to be part of a Gedud HaYivri, the Jewish brigade within the, um, the British army, because they wanted to do something, and, and rightly so. There are even um, members of the brigade under different auspices of the Yishuv, like for instance, Solel Bonet, which was the Israeli building company. They had their own unit within the Jewish brigade, uh, etc. So for Israelis, Israelis before the state, of course, and even after the state, the Shoah was one of the main, um, I would say, representations in real time and in real place, which really proved the need for a Jewish state. A need for a place where Jews stand up with their own weapons and are willing to protect themselves. In a sense, it gave a major boost to Jewish nationalism in the state of Israel and created a real raison d'etre of why this Jewish nationalism needs to be. Two things happened at the beginning of the state, aside from the law of return, that every Jew could come and become a citizen. Yad Vashem, the law passing Yad Vashem, the Holocaust Museum, the Shoah Museum, where every diplomat has to, coming to Israel has to see why we need a state of Israel because of the Shoah. Story is told, and maybe I told it before, May 14th, 1948, Ben-Gurion wants to declare a state, and he gets a call from Harry Truman, President of the United States, a few days before. Truman says, look, according to our information, if you declare a state of Israel, seven Arab countries are going to invade you. That's really difficult. I don't think you should do it. We're friends. Give us some time. We'll work it out. Maybe we'll work out a deal somehow with the Arab states. <clears throat> ben Goyon said, thank you, but he did it anyhow. Story goes, he turned to Yigal Yadin, who was at that time in charge of Israeli intelligence, Israeli, before the state. And he said, Yigal, tell me, what are our chances against seven Arab armies? Yadin said, not better than 50-50. Ben Gurion said, in the last 2,000 years, when has the Jewish people had such good odds of getting back their land? And he went ahead. But that's not the whole story. The reason why he went ahead, despite the fact the majority of his cabinet, by the way, <laughs> had hesitations and he had to coerce them to go along with him, but the reason why he went ahead, the reason why in the end of the day, everybody understood why he went ahead was because they were three years with their backs to the Shoah. And everybody knew what the Shoah meant and what other possibilities were and the real need and urgency to have a Jewish state. And they understood that the risk was a risk worth taking. So the Shoah was really part of the naissance, of the birth of the state of Israel. In fact, to such an extent that when the Shoah survivors started to come to Israel, whether through the Ma'apilim, the illegal um, immigration to Israel from 45 to 48 under the British, or whether after that, the Yishuv actually had a problem with these survivors. Don't they represent the Jews who didn't fight? Don't they represent the, the Galut Jews who went like sheep to, the, sheep, sheep to the slaughter? They didn't know what to do with them. And when the Shoah survivors saw that, they never mentioned that they were Shoah survivors. They were embarrassed even of the numbers on their hand. And the state set up a law, Yom HaShoah. What is Yom HaShoah? What date did they pick? the date of the Warsaw Ghetto uprising, the fighting Jew, the Jew who stands up, who's willing to give their life for the Jewish people. This is um, Yom HaShoah. And it's not just called Yom HaShoah, Yom HaShoah Vehagvura, which means the day of the Jewish resistance and uh, the day of valor and resistance. Later on, as the state of Israel matured, 
people started reinterpreting. That's the gvura, the strength, is the very fact the Jews survived. But in the early years of the state, they had an ideological friction um, with this concept because they were trying to create the new Jew, the proud Sabra, who stood with the gun in the hand and with a pruning fork <laughs> in the other hand in agriculture. So it took a while, it took a while. But the idea of the Shoah became an idea of strengthening Jewish nationalism. Even the trips to Poland through Misrata Chinuch, education, um, Ministry of Education, they see this as strengthening the idea of Zionism, Jewish nationalism within the students. Let's make a switch over now. That's one way of understanding the Shoah, the need for Jews first to stand up for their rights and for their people. In the United States, it's a very different story. Now, remember the vast amount of Jews who came to the United States came before the war. Okay, small amounts came in the uh, 18th and 19th century. The vast majority of Jews come the second half of the 19th century. So by 1930, there are already 5 million Jews in the United States before uh, the United States closes its doors to immigration, including Jewish immigration, despite the difficulties that happened in Nazi Germany from 1933. And the famous story of the, the ship that comes all the way to Miami and is sent back to Germany, of Jewish potential immigrants in the 30s. So <clears throat> the... Um, but also in the United States, many Jews become assimilated. And especially in the thinking of the reform movement, the question was how to deal with the Shoah. What is the meaning of the Shoah for Jews? And also because many Jews in the United States were becoming secular and losing their attachment to uh, observant Judaism, the Shoah became something tangible in Jewish history to talk about because so many people had parents and grandparents who had gone through either directly through the camps or indirectly through the persecution of the Second World War, no matter what country they might have been, somewhere in Europe, and not just. So it was something to talk about. It was something real. It was tangible. It made students interested. And so show education became big news in the United States. I would say much more than in Israel. Universities, if Jewish studies have to have Shoah studies or else they're nothing. High schools have to have classes on the Shoah. Elementary schools have to have uh, programs. <clears throat> and not necessarily the Israeli day of Yom HaShoah, that's not so important, but the idea is to talk about it and, and what does it mean. However, the thinking of American Jews was very different because for American Jews, first of all, the United States is a very, um, nationalistic country without saying it too much. <laughs> There's a lot of loyalism and allegiance to the flag in the United States, according to everybody's different interpretation. And um, Jews knew that in the United States, and they saw the United States as a land of freedom. And the more secular the Jew, the more they saw the U.S. as the redemption of the Jewish people. There are many Jews, of course, who had no problem with Israel, and that was their brethren and supporting but for assimilated Jews, Israel was a second thought. Remember, the vast majority of American Jews have never visited Israel. They don't really know much about what happens here. They only know through the media, which is not always so supportive. When the media is supportive, they're very happy. When the media is not supportive, they're a little bit um, embarrassed or uh, perplexed of what exactly to do and how to react. So the show education then in the United States was not we have to be more involved in Jewish religion. And I'm talking about the Orthodox reaction to the Shoah, which we'll talk about later. But it wasn't about we have to be more in, you know, into our traditions. We have that. No. It was all about understanding victimhood. We were the victims of anti-Semitism, so we understand victimhood. And if we understand victimhood, then we have to support victims worldwide. We need tikkun olam. We have to change the world by, for the better. 
If there are people starving in Darfur, we have to be the first ones to help. If there are communities in, Af in Africa, we've got to be there. <clears throat> if there are rights of people being oppressed in the United States, we have to be in the front line. This was the thinking. Nothing wrong with that thinking, but this was their understanding, their reaction to the Shoah. In addition, as Ruth Weiss uh, writes, the former um, Harvard um, professor of Yiddish, and one of the problems also that happened was that part of the Shoah education was the dangers of nationalism. Because didn't nationalism in Germany set the stage for the Shoah? So nationalism is dangerous. Maybe even Jewish nationalism is dangerous. Remember, the reform movement in the United States uh, was anti-Zionist until 1970. And then they changed their tone. But still, the Shoah education among many of the secular Jews also talks about the uh, shortcomings of nationalism and they don't always differentiate between these extreme forms of nationalism and nationalism. Isn't Zionism nationalism? Aren't those Jews slightly overdoing it? And uh, this has created a rift more today than 25 years ago, but a certain rift between what's going on in Israel and going on in the United States because the more, uh, let's say, movements, anti Israel movements, are able to win support, even for mythical stories of things that Israeli soldiers never did, but their media covers it, and of course, the media covers it, then it's real. So then Jews, especially young Jews on campuses, they become very nervous. Because I'm Jewish, I'm supposed to defend a country I've never been to, I have no idea, and if they're doing wrong things, I'm against them too. <laughs> okay? So they would rather either not be involved or sometimes even go to an extreme and say, I'm anti, so leave me alone. This has created a rift. It's not so much about what's going on in Israel, <laughs> like the average Israelis think. It's a rift of the very understanding of Judaism vis-a-vis -vis the trauma of the Shoah. The need to identify with the victim and the and the fear of nationalism. Now, these, by the way, are important things identifying with the victim. But I'm just saying, when you narrow down sometimes uh, the ideals of life to one or two things, it's not encompassing. It's not the whole story. You know, in the United States, in the courts, they say the truth, the whole truth. There's a difference between the truth and the whole truth. Life is about the whole truth. It's not about specific truths. That's story number two. Reaction number three. The Haredi community. There is a slight difference between the Haredi, the ultra-Orthodox community in Israel and in abroad. It, abroad, it's a different story for the simple reason that the ultra-Orthodox of the Haredi community had a very difficult time getting its act together after the Shoah. First of all, in the United States, there were very few, not just Haredi, any type of orthodoxy before the Second World War. You had some rabbis, there's a book called The, era, the Silver Era about Rabbi Silver, very important book about orthodoxy in America before the Second World War. And, um, but remember, a lot of rabbis in Europe told people, don't go. They told their yeshiva students, don't go to the United States. It'll just create assimilation. There are no yeshivas there, there are no real communities. And a lot of the observant Jews listened and did not go, especially the rabbis. After the Second World War, there was no choice. There was nowhere else to go. And uh, so the Jewish communities, especially among the Orthodox and the ultra-Orthodox, had to rebuild themselves. It was not a simple thing. It took a long time. It was against all odds, by the way. Most people thought that Haredi would be something of the past. The Hasidic movement wouldn't exist anymore. Remember, they were writing books about what the Hasidim used to be. Buber and Heschel and others. Nobody could actually um, envision the revival that exists today, especially in the state of Israel. So I think the first reaction, especially among the Haredim in the United States, was utter silence. 
in their education, didn't talk about it. In Israel, the state of Israel has a Yom HaShoah, it's a secular holiday, it has nothing to do with us. So the first reaction was silence. How do you talk about the decimation, not only of the Jewish people, but of all the rabbis and all the yeshivot and all the major movements? How do you talk about it without bringing a person to um, distrust their faith? So they didn't want to talk about it. That was the first reaction, which is interesting because that was also the reaction of the survivors themselves. But this is for a very different reason. The second reaction, which happened in Israel, was creating a new narrative, excuse me, and creating the new narrative really meant creating a community. What was the new narrative? It's a community which its raison d'etre is now to rebuild what was destroyed. You know, there's a famous story of the, the Mir Yeshiva in Lithuania today, Belarus, which was able to save, the whole yeshiva was saved. They got on trains. One of them was even on Shabbat in, to make their way to Shanghai in uh, Japanese occupied China. And then they stayed there during the war and survived the war, the whole yeshiva. And the people who survived that devastation of Lithuanian Jewry from the yeshiva saw themselves as a Noah's Ark. They have to replant themselves in the new world, whether it's in Israel or in America or in Canada or in, or in uh, South Africa, where there was also a community or in Argentina, where they replant themselves, replant the yeshiva world. Among the Hasidim too, they started creating this narrative. But the Haredi narrative was, we must rebuild even if we have to go to extreme, we now to create an insular community, not look around what's going on right and left, but rebuild what was. We're going to look backwards. And we're going to make sure that our grandparents and their parents who are not around, that our grandchildren will look like our grandparents. Because we have to rebuild that world. That is our mitzvah. But what happened was, within that narrative, there's a little bit of fairy tales. How wonderful the yeshiva world was how thriving and prosperous and how spiritual the Jews were. <laughs> okay, let me put it this way. I don't want to say anything bad about Chas Shalom about the Jewish people, but I'm just saying that the narrative is a little bit rosy. There is no question that in the state of Israel today, there are at least 10 times more yeshivot and yeshiva students than there ever was in all of Eastern Europe together. Not even a question. And Western Europe. It's not even a question. Famous yeshivot like Volozhin, you can see the size of the building. It's still, it's still there. How many people can get into it? 200 people maybe on a good day. I mean, you know, the shiva world was an important phenomenon. Not a question. But it never reached the numbers that you have in the state of Israel today. I mean, it's mind-boggling, the numbers of people studying yeshivot, for whatever reason. And obviously, you're going to have a lot of people in yeshivot. Even if they're not a lot of talented people, there will be a certain amount which are talented, which are produced. <clears throat> also, spiritualism, it's not exactly that there was, you know, I mean, the let's say the tides of secularism took over the Jewish people well before the Shoah. Uh, between the wars in Poland, there was uh, a very strong reform movement. There was the Bundes. There was there were secularized Jews um, who had left the um, left the fold, and the yeshiva world was really struggling. Hasidism was struggling well before the war. So I'm saying the 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 tide of secularism that started in the 19th century and made its way into the 20th century uh, took a great toll on the Jewish people. So this happened much before the war. So <clears throat> I'm just so I'm just saying that you know the stories of Rosie, uh, there is something to it. Um, Heschel did that too, by the way. Heschel wrote a book called "The Earth Is the Lord's," which is really a eulogy of Eastern European Jewry and the Hasidic movement. A beautiful eulogy, 
Um, but he unfortunately really thought it was a eulogy. He wasn't sure if people would even understand what he was talking about. But the narrative of the ultra-Orthodox of the Haredi movement was not a eulogy, we're going to recreate it <laughs> in Israel. Sometimes to an extreme, all the boys must study in yeshiva, nobody should work, let your wives work, which of course is against Jewish law and the Mishnah Tubot. But okay, I want to go into those issues at the moment. But the way that they were able to deal with the trauma of the Shoah was let's replant, rebuild, recreate, even if we have to do it in a laboratory, an insular community, because this is what we owe them, and this is going to be our act of defiance and our act of faith. There's a downside to all of these three reactions. In Israel, seeing the Shoah just as the Jew has to stand up and fight for their rights, left out, of course, well, in general, this is a discussion which I don't want to go into now. Remember, Zionism was all about how to create a state. But it seemed like such a far-fetched concept that nobody even thought about what's the state supposed to be? Is it supposed to be a state of Jews or a Jewish state? And if so, and if it is a Jewish state, what type of content is there supposed to be? This seems so far down the line that almost nobody discussed it, except for a few philosophers of Zionism. Echad Am, let's say, Rabbi Cook, and others. The, so the downside in Israel that was the lack of the discussion, uh, in my opinion, uh, laid the roots for some of the post-Zionism that we see in Israel today. But this is another discussion. In the United States, uh, the downside, I think, is, is obvious. Uh, if you're just calling yourself a victim and identifying with the victims, sooner or later, someone's going to call you a perpetrator too. And then what do you do? Okay, whether it's true or not. Secondly, you have to be proud of being Jewish. You have to be proud of your heritage. And a lot of these Jews who only learned about the Shoah were not taught that. They weren't taught enough about their heritage and what to be proud of. It's not about being proud about being a victim. Who wants to be a victim? I don't want to be a victim. <laughs> so I want to be a proud of something positive. And of course, the downside in the Haredi community is that when you create a laboratory of an insular community, you're going to have a certain amount of fallout. Not everybody is going to be happy to take care of that experiment. You have to be more easygoing, even if you think that the ends justifies the, the ends justifies the means. And fallout, there's a lot of fallout in the Haredi world. So the truth is, like what very often happens that within all these three reactions, there is a kernel, kernel of truth. The idea of tikkun olam is a very important idea. The idea of Jewish nationalism is a very important idea. And the idea of trying to rebuild the Jewish people um, culturally and spiritually is an important idea. But when you take things to extreme, the, um, it has, or, or, or you make them just isolated, let's put it that way, it can have some bearings. And really these three reactionary communities within the Jewish people have to come together and have to learn from each other the values and the strengths of what they are trying to recreate after the traumatic uh, event of the Shoah. Shalom, shalom.